Nice. Looks like we're back. Just need a second here to prep. Welcome back. Bayesian Cognitive Modeling. Day 11. This is where I study how to do Bayesian inference, particularly for the purpose of the building psychological or building models to understand psychological properties. I follow along the exercises in this book and we're just gonna keep moving where we were in the series. So yesterday we started part three, model selection, and we went over most, it was mostly a conceptual day where we overviewed much of what we're going to be using in this uh, section that is you know, how do we identify how do we do hypothesis testing what are some of the characteristics or criteria in order to assess if a model was complex and then how does Bayesian how do the maths of Bayesian equations um, how do they uh, account for or penalize the complexity or over overt complexity of models in such a way where we can um, draw a fair shot like just because it's complex doesn't mean that it's going to be uh, a better model we talked about a particular method for evaluating the fit between two models and now we're going to move into chapter eight where it's going to be much more applied and we're going to be back in our studio uh, running through some of the code and talking through the, some of these exercises where it looks like we're going to start doing t-tests um, gaussian mean comparing so that'll be cool it's not a t-test, but it's essentially, it ends up looking like one, you know, if you think about it conceptually similar. Um, cool. So let's get to the... So reiterating, big takeaways from yesterday are these points. Complex models are models that make many predictions. Models can make many predictions because they have broad priors. They because they have many parameters, right? Many predictions because they have a lot of parameters. They have very diffuse priors that aren't precise, um, and or, or they take on very complicated functional forms. Uh, base factors is a way we can. Uh, penalize models for this complexity so in favor of parsimony so base factors is the relative evidence between two models um, and we have some conventional practices for assessing the effect size for interpreting a base factor and we have to be careful about our prior distributions impact or influence on the posterior because this can down the road impact the inference that we draw if we're using base factors. And of course, extraordinary claims, extraordinary evidence. So we're going to start with chapter eight here. Right. 
popular theories are difficult to under to overthrow. So we're gonna be talking about Dr. John's seasonal memory model. And here are the predictions of his memory model. But Dr. Smith's not buying it. The, m the model predicts, so the seasonal memory model is going to predict glucose is going to increase in recall performance rather than summer than in winter. So memory is better in the summer rather than the winter because of glucose driven increases due to seasonal changes. Yet, when Dr. Smith does this experiment, he gets the opposite results. But he gets this p-value here, which is just a non-significant result. However, we know that a reviewer is going to say that a null result doesn't mean that there's no effect. So this is a very <laughs> nice trick that Dr. John uses in order to avoid his theory being disproven, where he says, Okay, so you didn't find a significant effect. So what? Um, you can't say I'm wrong because um, because you found no findings. That's correct. So if we moved into a Bayesian framework, however, we know that we could find the relative evidence for one hypothesis to the other, and we could find evidence for there being no effect explicitly. So... In this section, then we're gonna we're gonna do something like this. So this section highlights some of the properties of base factor in the context of a popular of the popular t test. So we show we're gonna specify how the null and the the alternative hypothesis, and then we're gonna use the ratio calculation to calculate base factors from the savage dicky method we talked about last chapter. So we're going to be able to answer the question specifically um, to the extent that the data contradict the prediction of the model that John proposed. So let's see if Dr. Smith is right. So one sample comparisons. So we assume the data follows a Gaussian distribution and we don't know the, the average or the variance. So that null hypothesis states the mean difference is equal to zero. Alternative states not equal to zero. He's a couchy. Hmm. So we're defining a prior based on the effect size here. And the value of doing so is that the same prior can be used across many experiments. That's because effect sizes are they don't have a scale in the sense that they generalize across um, experimental designs. So a mean, sample mean, specific to the, the sample, an effect size is supposed to be this underlying uh, effect or magnitude of what we would observe in the population. Mm. What we, yeah. Mm -hmm. Cauchy distribution is used for this prior as a T distribution. So I'm going to go and turn around and grab my textbook here because last night I was actually just reading about different distributions because what we're discussing it in the context of... Like I have this homework assignment where for one of my Bayesian classes. Um, so I want to, I'm just trying to paint a relationship for where the, this particular distribution. Oh, actually, I think I have a, I have something that might be helpful over here. Nope. Let me get it.
one of the textbooks I've been using um, for my own like self-learning is uh, a student's guide to Bayesian statistics. It's Ben Lampert. He's a, a lot of nice online videos tutorials that go along with the textbook. And so I've been uh, supplementing and the chapters read really short, brief, hit on the key points, really emphasize. We're just going to discuss the key points and no more, no less. So I found this book uh, extremely useful as a supplementary resource that I've been reading in conjunction with Bayesian Cognitive Modeling and my other textbooks. Okay, so they have some nice graphs in here. They have a nice little diagram showing the relationship between a lot of these uh, distribution distributions. So just taking a look here, I see county distribution is a student's t distribution, as I said there. With one degree of freedom, right? So when v is equal to one. And a half cow tree then can be derived from a cow tree. Cow tree, half cow tree, cow tree, students t, students t. And it could be like a standard normal when the degrees of freedom are infinite. This is cool. It's a really cool diagram. So I've been just trying to really. It also just demonstrates the inner relationship between or among all of these uh, probability distributions. So ultimately, even when we're talking from continuous to uh, discrete scales, you know, there's a relationship, there's something that maps all these together, right? So you can imagine in discrete scale, we have Poisson that maps back to a continuous scale of a normal distribution, right? And then that could be a link between discrete and continuous. And um, this is, it's very, very cool to see this map of how like we can parameterize probability distributions though ultimately they all like link together um, in this coherent way yes. cool so Kauchi fatter tails so let's take a look at the graphical model here and it's going to be in the one sample test script. X is the observed data. And the observed data is going to have mean and variance. And we can determine the mean from the effect size here. and sigma so it's sigma times the effect size gives us these things are related interrelated to one another so this is going to give us mu <coughs> pardon me is a pretty simple model we observe some data here each trial what is this this is the data right the null hypothesis puts all prior mass on a single point as zero whereas the alternative assumes that the as a Cauchy distribution which is distributed zero to one. So we have sigma as Cauchy distribution zero to one, though we can't have negative variance. So it's restricted range from zero to infinity. Here, the effect is gonna be from zero to one and then Gaussian distribution mu and precision. Pretty simple model. Let's crack it open. Ooh. 
exciting new section. I'm gonna set the working directory. And then we need the one sample and the one sample jag. Oh. Plus spline. Oh, this package I just wanted me to install what was about. Polynomial spline routines. Looks like we're going to calculate the log density using a spline. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Also going to pull up that stand code. This is a pretty simple example too, so it makes for a useful case. So for each observation, we have a normal distribution mu lambda. Mu is equal to delta sigma. Lambda is equal to sigma power negative two. This is just like we estimate sigma, but then we derive lambda so we can use it for di the distribution. But we're interested in sigma, right? So this is one of those like hierarchical effects we're seeing when we're doing this sort of estimation technique. We have to get other parameters to get the parameters we're interest interested in. So. so we get posterior distributions in order to get the full conditional. Lambda delta is distributed chi squared. Delta is distributed normal. Lambda sigma. Why do we need these lambda deltas, lambda sigmas? What are they used for? Delta and sigma come from half country. Uh, it looks like we use these chi squares to get country distributions. So lambda delta is distributed to chi. Sigma is the absolute value of the temp. This is a way, so we're only getting the, we're not using that restricted range thing, but we're making it so that we only get the, the positive ones. Delta prior, lambda delta prior. And we need that information because uh, 
All right, here we go. Not directly available in wing bugs. A chi-square distribution with one degree of freedom. So we're doing a county because we know that certain specifications of types of distributions are equivalent to the distribution we're interested in. Just a chi-square of one. This is two-step assignment. And we're also getting the prior and posterior predictive checks or predictive distributions. Or just prior distributions. Delta prior. Delta. And applies the savage Dickey ratio test to the posterior samples to compute the base factor. So let's take a look. So this model is then applied in the R script. And we're just going to go through here. So we have our data from our two samples. So we have data for winter and we have data for summer. And we can do winter minus summer because it's a within subject design. So we're going to get the difference and now we're just going to get a z-score. So these are the standardized differences across ac across the difference between summer and winter. And now we're going to assess how long it is. We have 41 samples and now all we need is the data and the length. And now we're using three chains, so we're going to initialize the parameters that we have priors for, which is sigma temp and delta, as shown here. We have sigma temp and delta, because sigma temp and delta, lambda delta, this is chi squared, so chi squared, lambda delta, lambda delta, delta, right? And then sigma temp. Lambda sigma, lambda sigma. So you could see how, okay, I have this chi square distribution, lambda sigma. This is going to give us my Cauchy because we have one degree of freedom here. And it's going to give me sigma temp. Sigma temp is what I'm going to use to get the sigma with no negative values. Here, once again, Cauchy. And then we are able to get delta. That's the initializations. And then we're only interested in delta here. And now we run it, ran pretty quickly. I um, also would like to print it. Not looking good because we got this delta here. Here's the average difference. And notice how the credible interval is going to go through zero. So, so far it's not looking good for the seasonal hypothesis theory. So here, we collect posterior samples across all the chains. So now give me all of the posterior distributions across the chains. And now I'm going to use base factor based on log spine fit. So po fit posterior to log spine. So I'm going to get this fit. What is this output? It gives me log likelihood across a range of penalties and knots. What happens if I do this summary? 
same thing. Coefficient. So now we use Q load. What is this? Looks like it takes our fit. Same package. So log spline density and estimation, cumulative quantiles. So we're doing quantiles. This is going to output the density at. So we fit a density. We use a spline to fit a curve to the data, the posterior distribution. And now we're getting the value of density. For the 95 incredible intervals so we get the values at those two intervals which correspond if you look so we have x0 here so we want the 25 percent so if you look here this value corresponds here pretty nicely so part of the print summary is we're getting this information and then if you look at x1 we're also getting this information here. So 4.1 and 4.8. So close. And now that we have those intervals, let's see, this gives the PDF delta zero. So if we use D log spline, D log spline is density. So it'll give me the density at zero. Couchy. So now give me what the density at zero would be for a prior as. So now we have our prior distribution, which we knew was Calci. And now we're taking our posterior distribution. And we're getting the density at zero. And now we're going to take the posterior over the prior, which is a base factor. And we have a base factor of six, which if we look at last chapter, was like evidence in favor of one hypothesis, right? moderate evidence in favor of the prior. That's what the book shows. So let's see. P 
plots the power so there's Dickey ratio test posterior samples of the difference compute the base factor of the null and the prior the posterior distribution is peaked near zero with a little more density given to positive rather than negative effect sizes the critical point difference equals zero is about five times more likely in the posterior distribution than it is in the prior. This means that the Bayes factor is about five to one in favor of the null hypothesis. So we do this ratio of a point estimate. Prior. All right, so we have this prior, this value, and we do a ratio of this above that is the posterior at zero and there's evidence in favor of the posterior which in this case is centralized at zero so look at the mean Here we assume the half Cauchy prior distribution on the standard deviation sigma. Other choices are possible and reasonable. Could you think of a few? Instead of a half Cauchy distribution, sure. Thinking back to the chapter, just I'm thinking of my like table in my head. So there are other di distributions we could have used. Student T, a T distribution. Normal distribution, T distribution. These all seem like fair. <coughs> I guess you could also, oh, because we did this restricted range thing. You could use a uniform distribution that was range restricted, right? Or inverse gamma, we were using a lot in last chapter too. the answer is just like anything anything could go so long as you know, it was informative so keep in mind what we did here i'm just reflecting on and looking at this picture again we calculated the density for this distribution and we calculated the density for this distribution we asked give me the density in the posterior distribution at zero and now I know what distribution my prior is from what's the density at zero there okay now give me the ratio between these two and we saw more evidence in favor of zero in the posterior than in the prior
We need that when we observe data. The idea that we can have a zero difference between the two seasons increased in probability. It's more likely. Do you think the different priors of sigma will lead to different conclusions? Hmm. No. But we can tech. We can try the inverse gamma.
doesn't look like the uh, distribution changes the results. So we changed lambda instead of being determined by sigma. Lambda is distributed. And then we use that lambda to determine sigma. Temp. Lambda delta prior. Delta prior. I think that's how you do it. example unif d unif d unif reason that didn't work there is because our initialization involved um, potentially variability that violated the specifications we set, I think. Either or. What's the base factor? Give me these. Same results. So it doesn't look like the prior is having much of an impact on the results.
because I had Lambda there, not Lambda Sigma. Lambda Sigma. But where is Lambda Sigma, right? There we go. So here's the base factor with the uniform, and there's the base factor with the... Not too much a difference. Oh, yeah, interesting enough, stand code. So here, one symbol t-test, basically. For data, initialize data vector of the data x which is the this is the differences right then we have the parameters which is going to be real sigma temp and delta so we have sigma temp and delta these are the things that we also notice are the two things that we initialize in our jag script delta sigma temp <laughs> and then we're going to we have some transformations we have mu and sigma with the lower bound because we can't have negative variance, right? But sigma is equal to absolute value of sigma temp. Uh, we define sigma temp here in the parameters, and then we only want the absolute values. And then mu. So notice we specify the transform parameters, and then we indicate where these transform parameters are derived from where delta times sigma is equal to mu and sigma is equal to temp. And now for our model, sigma temp, which is specified up here, is a Cauchy. Stan has Cauchy distributions. Delta is also a Cauchy. And our data then, we expect your normal mu sigma. Pretty simple. And we do the same exact procedure. So the data transfer, so the differences here are one, Stan has c access to Cauchy distributions um, directly. And just some differences in syntax for specification where here we don't have to specify the lambdas and do all those tricks with lambdas, we just can specify sigma. No, we do use, still use the temp thing so that we can avoid negative values. Right. We also assumed a Cauchy prior distribution for delta. Other choices are possible. One such choice is a standard Gaussian distribution. Do you think this prior will lead to substantially different conclusions? Convince yourself by implementing it. I don't think so, because Gaussian down the road is just at large enough effect size as Gaussian distributions are equivalent to Cauchy, right? So, that is just delta prior. size delta delta lambda delta and look 
it's very similar. Well, something interesting to note that I was reading the some of the notes on this problem. For that last problem, when we were thinking about changing very uh, distributions for sigma, uh, keep in mind that sigma isn't the parameter of interest, and so when we're doing these Bayes factor um, ratios, right, uh, based on the Savage-Dickey um, test right, of just like the pure ratio between the parameters of interest, Savage-Dickey method. Um, it doesn't really matter. It does the sigmas and differences in sigma aren't of that big of an interest because they wash out in the average because of how we compare the two models. In order to make this a normal distribution, a standard Gaussian, we just change this to lambda. I'm just looking for an example with a Gaussian distribution that just use gamma. Just use an inverse gamma. D gamma point zero zero one point zero zero one. Take these. 
claim the delta. Seems right. Okay, increase tighter. Let's see why. So I made it so that delta came from an inverse gamma distribution. So even more evidence in favor. So even more mass towards zero. I would think something's up. So that's just an uninformative prior for Delta, right? I'm not seeing much change in the results. Even when I change delta to be distributed, it's not changing the, the results that much. So I'll just keep moving. So the base factor here then quantifies the strength of evidence for this versus this. This point 
Where's the distribution? This particular was not the hypothesis that he set out to test. He stated that it should be negative. So a more appropriate incorporates this constraint. Half count you. Negative numbers. So we use an interval. Difference between the two models here. So this still has to be positive, but now we're adding this range restriction here. So let's take a look at the order restricted model. this order restricted one find the difference same thing here data is still distributed lambda mu mu is still calculated doing this combination of delta and sigma lambda is still estimated here we still use a Cauchy distribution but now delta is normally distributed lambda delta with an interval set, so t here, from infinite, from negative infinity to zero. So now we specify it being restricted range. Lambda sigma, same thing. And now d norm, we make it so that the interval is restricted here. Good, and then negative Fs. So we make sure all these are negative here. factor this time big you asked for it so now two times here why do we multiply by two here we get this and then two times this because we're doing a two-tailed test perhaps what does u bound do here bound so we have an upper bound of zero for the density calculation because the value we theoretically know or they specified that it's going to be zero so when we're testing the hypotheses against one another we want it to be as close to the specification that we uh, verbally stated so because the difference was 
predicted to be negative, we are setting this upper bound of zero for the density of the distribution. It's also nicely indicated here. And you see how this kind of looks cut off. Um, that's in part because we're only testing this side of the distribution. That's even larger. Now, 10 times more likely under the null, under order restricted hypothesis two. Strong evidence against the null. Strong evidence for the null hypothesis. So strong evidence in favor of a difference equal to zero. talks about the two times thing. Excuse me. Estimating Bayes' factor using the Savage-Dickey approach requires estimating the height of the prior and posterior distribution of a specific boundary parameter. This is what this is what that package is doing. In R, one such estimator included plus blind package. So we're using a non-parametric density estimator, which is the splines approach. So we're able to calculate these des these dens destiny density estimates for the Savage-Dickey approach um, using a non-parametric estimator. Okay. For completeness, estimate the base factor for the summer and winter between and hypothesis three, positive. Still, though, so I change it so that we have a lower bound instead of an upper bound limit. While it's less in favor of the null hypothesis, we still are in favor of the null hypothesis. And also, just change the initialization so they fit this restriction of range. Oh. I think I need to change that too, to make sure. Same stuff.
So even when we assume that the order effect is positive, we're still seeing evidence in favor of the null hypothesis here. That being that there's an effect with zero uh, difference in the parameter between winter and summer. And that's something we couldn't do in frequentist models where we're deliberately identifying evidence in favor of the null hypothesis um, relative to an alternative hypothesis. So let's see. In this example, it matters whether the alternative is unrestricted or restricted to negative values or, or restricted positive values. Why is this perfectly reasonable? Can you think of a situation where the three versions of the alternative yield exactly? It matters whether the alternative hypothesis is one of these three. Can you think of a situation where the three versions of the alternative would lead to this exactly the same base factor? Using the term exactly here. If instead we were comparing the alternative hypothesis to a, a null that included one of those three restrictions, that doesn't make sense. See, in this case, it's interesting because it seems to be telling me, or in the last problem, I should have found a difference in results. I found still support for the there being no effect. And so... I found less support, but I still found support for there being no effect. Not as large as that. So why is it perfectly reasonable? They would yield the same results if the posterior was just definitely equal to zero. Slight differences in the results are due to the posterior not being perfectly aligned with zero. Yet, so when I calculated a posterior distribution, if it definitely led to me seeing you know, the average posterior um, estimate for delta was zero, then whether I did range restricted in one way, range restricted in the other way, or order, 
or sorry, order restricted, whether it was for positive or for negative, it can be the same. And if it's this in the middle, it's still the same. So we could see the same result if it tr if the true parameter was most likely to be on zero, especially since these distributions are symmetric. Or, or, or because the distribution is symmetric. It wouldn't matter which side of of the alternative hypothesis we tested. It would give us the same result. From a From a practical standpoint, we do not need a new graphical model to compute base factor for null versus order restricted. Instead, we can use the original that does an unrestricted and then just not use the posterior samples that are inconsistent with this. Right, so I didn't actually need I didn't need to add this. So if I remove this new restriction. And then I come over here. Now delta posterior here. What it's saying is that from here, we have these. I can still test what I was testing before because I have this delta posterior distribution that's unrestricted. So Now that I've collected all the posterior samples, the posterior samples of interest to me are only the ones that fit a specific criteria. Um, so I could take this and I could make it so that we only add samples that fit I think I'm just a subset here, right?
we don't got names. Maybe this. Cool. So now we look only positives. I can just do the same here. if I need that. see so I'm getting different results because I'm restricting the range of the, the delta posterior distribution I'm deriving that straight from the output here, not so I don't necessarily have to embed those restrictions within uh, my JAGS model. And it might, if I'm not mistaken, it might just be computationally more expensive to do these sorts of restrictions embedded in here when I can do them in software over here. So it might be worth it not to do it that way. The last one for this question, then, it shows us another method to obtain base factors for order restricted model comparisons. So let's pull up that website then. And we're looking at for Wagam, Mocker, and Mori 2013. Now we're looking for okay. Mori are working together a lot. If I'm looking for a paper specifically talking about base factor. Testing order constraints. It's a 2015 paper, so this is wrong in the textbook, it looks like. Yes, it is. Oh, simple relations between, there we go.
base factor, inferential techniques, is computing that we highlight. Oh, one sec. See ya. So we're highlighting. How we can compute these relationships easily for order restricted tests. And it wants me to focus. The question specifically says most reliable and it avoids numerical complications associated with having to estimate posterior densities at boundary. So we go here, read the introduction, focus on implementer's suggested method, compare the results. Let's see what they say. Base factors are ratios corresponding to marginal likelihoods. Thus, B are means. Avoiding, of avoiding this, avoiding the need for integration when we already have the two one. Uh, so the restricted base is the likelihood times where the difference is proportional to all values. all the values given that we have and some mean for the two-sided model so restricted probability over one over the Restricted ratio is equal to restricted because the total prior probability of all orderings is one, the prior odds m sub r against the encompassing mo model are thus corresponding posterior R so we're able to calculate this term from so the unrestricted Bayes two-sided base factor we have. And we just multiply the two-sided base factor times
I'm looking, I'm looking. The restricted times the two sided. Restricted base factor times the two sided base factor gives us the base factor of the restricted null. And then it's just building a rationale for why we might want to use a one sided test. So one ordered tests are complicated and we need to be cautious. Though from the two sided test it the two sided base factor calculated using base factor. No that we use base factor. And just demonstrating how the one sided test more accurately reflects what we're looking at here. essentially just demonstrating the importance and that the software can also implement these things for us. So what I'm drawing from this is that base factors can be calculated or derived. One sided base factor tests can be derived from some combination of information from the base factor of the two sided test when we're using sampling approaches that we're using here. When the two-sided tests are already in hand, yeah. So then we're showing how two-sided tests, when we have it, we can calculate one-sided tests. Cool. Alright, that's it for today, I think. Looks like we're going to get into two sample t-tests tomorrow. Or the Bayesian two sample t-tests. So the comparison of two means. So this is the first case of just us you know, doing some simple hypothesis testing for mean differences where we are taking a look at the posterior distribution for delta and we're um, extracting information from it, the samples um, in such a way that allows us to use um, ratios of base factors in order to infer the relevant evidence for one hypothesis over another. Though we have to use density estimation strategies to get that, and it might be easier in order to derive some sort of information using simpler approaches than what we did here, which was talked about and discussed in this paper that it points us to. So it's just stating that there are other approaches for us to get the information we require from the parameters to do these sorts of tests. Um, and for my case, as an applied person, um, 
it's just important to n understand the, dis the distinctions between that these approaches and to be cautious when we're calculating these sorts of things um, and interpreting them from software. So n tomorrow, then we'll start with the two sample t-test. Uh, thanks for sticking around today, guys. Um, I'm just about at time now. Mm -hmm. So I'll see you tomorrow and have a 